This is a demonstration video looking at bismuth metal, some of the properties and some of the ways you can use bismuth. Bismuth is positioned near the end of the periodic table with an atomic number of 83. Surprisingly, bismuth is an incredibly stable element with a half-life about a billion times the age of the known universe. So when you handle bismuth metal, it is truly like holding a piece of stardust. Bismuth has a relatively low melting point of 271.5 degrees Celsius, so bismuth is easily melted using a blowtorch, as shown here. To save a little time, the video in this section is sped up five times normal speed. Now we're going to cast some bismuth into this aluminium mold. So we use a hacksaw blade in this case to help separate the slag layer off as we're pouring the molten bismuth into the mold. Bismuth has one of the unique properties of very few materials. It actually expands on solidification. So there are no shrinkage voids on casting. And here is the puck that we cast. We will keep this later for a future experiment. We will show it towards the end of the video. Due to the low melting point of bismuth metal, I've also found that it's possible to cast bismuth metal into silicone molds, the type of molds that are used to make candles or plaster of Paris figurines. When we pour our bismuth metal into this mold, we can see some bubbling occurring. This is definitely not bismuth metal boiling, as the boiling point is 1,564 degrees Celsius for bismuth. This is more likely to be moisture or a mold release agent present within the mold. So this will distract from the precision casting, in this case, of our dragon. Another type of casting process is investment, or lost wax casting. This has been around for some 5,000 plus years, originally used by the Egyptian, Chinese, and Greek civilizations. Today, investment casting is still used for some precision castings. For example, modern day gas turbine blades for jet engines are made by investment casting. The lost wax casting process is based on a series of steps. Firstly, a wax positive is made. This has runners and risers connected to channel the flow of molten metal. This wax preform is covered in a ceramic. Once the ceramic is hardened, the wax is burnt off. Historically, the wax used would have been beeswax. After removing the wax, the ceramic, if necessary, is fired and molten metal is poured into the cavity. After the metal solidifies, the ceramic is knocked off and hey presto, a metal form of the original wax preform is released. So here we are at the first phase. So we have our wax preform of our dragon. Now we're using some candlesticks. This is paraffin wax. And we're going to connect these to our dragon to form our riser and runner. So we have somewhere to pour the molten metal in. You can perform investment casting with a range of metals, not just bismuth. It just happens that bismuth is a very easy metal to use. It has a low melting point and low toxicity, which is also the reason why bismuth is replacing lead in a lot of applications. For example, lead-free solder, lead shot, using shotgun shells, and fishing weights in terms of sinkers, and bismuth has also got applications in cosmetics in the form of pigments. This is used as makeup. So bismuth has a wide range of applications. Now we're at the phase where we're covering our wax preform with a ceramic. In this case, we're using plaster of Paris. 
So we mix up some plaster of Paris with water, we pour this into a mould, put our dragon in the mould and then pack the rest of the plaster of Paris around the dragon. When investment casting is performed in industry, there's typically a number of slurries, different types of ceramic are used. There is a very fine slurry which initially coats the wax preform, then they build a much coarser ceramic on the top. Of course, when they do this in industry, they're not casting bismuth, they're casting higher temperature metals. So these ceramics are more alumina based. And after they burn the wax out from these alumina based ceramics, they need to fire the alumina so that when they pour the molten metal in, the thermal shock doesn't cause the mold to crack. And typically, they also preheat the mold before casting. This has the effect of ensuring that the mold fully fills with the molten metal before the metal solidifies and also helps prevent against thermal shock. Here we are using a small oven to burn out the wax. This needs to be performed in a well ventilated environment. As remember, candle wax vapor is highly combustible. Now using not so a steady hand, the molten bismuth is poured into the mould. After the molten bismuth has solidified and cooled down to room temperature, we can now knock the ceramic mould off the bismuth. In this case, we're using a hammer. Pure bismuth metal is a brittle material, so we need to be gentle when we're tapping with our hammer, not to fracture our bismuth. So after a few gentle taps of our hammer, we've successfully managed to release our bismuth dragon. We just need to clean up the bismuth dragon using a fine wire brush. Bismuth is also used in medication in the form of bismuth subsalicylate, or better known as Pepto-Bismol. These pink tablets of Pepto-Bismol apparently cure diarrhea and also stomach upsets. The active ingredient that they contain is a small amount of bismuth subsalicylate. I don't know how to synthesize this compound, but looking on the internet it is possible to extract bismuth metal from this. So to start with we break up our tablets to increase the surface area, so we tap them with a hammer, this crushes them up. So after we've crushed our tablets, the next stage is to add it to a beaker containing muric acid. This is basically hydrochloric acid. Muric acid is used to clean concrete and is commonly available. So the reaction that should take place, the bismuth contained within the bismuth subsalicylate should react with the hydrochloric acid forming bismuth chloride, which is aqueous in the liquid. We're also forming some other byproducts. I can't be exactly sure what they are, but starch looks like one of them. Starch is typically added to tablets to bulk them up. 
because the active ingredient is typically only a very small fraction. So let the reaction sit overnight, so I don't think it's going to dissolve any more of the bismuth. So the next phase now is to filter the solution. So to do this, we use a funnel and we're going to use a coffee filter paper. Then we pour our solution through the filter and the bismuth chloride should go through the filter as it is aqueous in the solution. Leaving behind the leftover products, probably including a lot of starch. So here is our filtered solution, which is clear. It should contain unreacted hydrochloric acid and also bismuth chloride. So in order to get the bismuth metal out of solution, we're going to react it with aluminium. So introducing a small amount of aluminium foil results in a displacement reaction or substitution. So bismuth chloride is reacting with the aluminium to form bismuth metal, which is what is precipitating out of solution, and also aluminium chloride. Aluminium chloride is soluble in the liquid. After no more aluminium reacts with the solution, the reaction is complete. So the next stage is to filter the solution. And the solid that we collect is bismuth metal. Once our filtering is finished, we now take the filter paper and dry it. Although to be honest, I haven't fully dried it. Then you take the residue, put it into a container, and then heat it, then hopefully you should fuse it all together and create a nugget of pure bismuth metal. On heating, there are competing reactions occurring. Our goal, of course, is to melt the bismuth and form a nugget. However, oxidation is also a strong possibility. As melting is not performed in an inert atmosphere, oxygen is present, and the product before we were heating was also moist with water as the previous filter product was not fully dried out at low temperature. So oxidation is also a possibility. On looking at the product that was formed, it doesn't look like we've been that successful. However, there are a few shiny particles indicating that we may have formed some metallic bismuth. Another nice demonstration of bismuth is to form bismuth crystals. To do this, it is relatively easy to make smaller ones. To make large ones takes a lot more skill. So to begin with, we melt some bismuth, and then we've removed the slag layer which is on the surface. So you can see we're removing the slag layer using a hacksaw blade. I'm going to keep this slag or dross and at some point in the future I'm going to try that chemical purification process again with the hydrochloric acid and see if I'm going to be more successful at creating nuggets of bismuth metal. With the heat turned off, the liquid base of metal slowly begins to solidify. We are trying to grow crystals from the top down. So what we want is the crystals to grow in the center, but not to solidify and attach to the sides of the container, as this will make removing the crystal very difficult. A hacksaw blade is being used to test for solidification from the center to the walls of the container so that we have a good indication when it is time to remove our crystal. So I think now is about the right time to, to remove our crystal and let's see what we've got. So using a pair of pliers we remove the solidified layer at the surface and look, we have got some bismuth crystals. Now the metal slowly tarnishes in air to give that purpley appearance. 
And with the metal so close to its melting point, it's very easy to remelt and pull another crystal. In our final demonstration, we're going to look at some of the diamagnetic properties of bismuth. So to do this, we have some bismuth. These are the pucks that we cast earlier on at the beginning of the video. Diamagnetism is a type of magnetic interaction that occurs when a material generates an internal field that opposes an external magnetic field. Bismuth has the greatest diamagnetic susceptibility of any element, or it is the most diamagnetic element at room temperature in the periodic table. An ideal diamagnetic susceptibility constant would be minus 1, which is only possible with superconductors. To show the diamagnetic effect, we are going to levitate a small rare earth magnet between the pucks of bismuth metal. You can see the small magnet is attracted to the tip of a screwdriver. However, because of the weak diamagnetic force, we need to bias the system using a larger rare earth magnet that we're going to locate at the top of the system. There are various forces at play. Obviously, gravity is pulling the small magnet down. However, there is an opposing force as the small magnet is being pulled upwards by attraction of the larger magnet on top. The bismuth where the magnet is in between, is repelling the magnet from top and bottom due to bismuth's diamagnetic behavior. Two plates of bismuth are used for stability and to center the small magnet within the system. By adjusting the position of the larger magnet on top, it is possible to balance all these forces and levitate the smaller magnet between the two pucks of bismuth metal. And here we can see our small little magnet levitating between the two pucks of bismuth as we have balanced all the forces. So we can see the parts of the system, top permanent magnet, bismuth, bismuth, and our tiny little permanent magnet that we're levitating. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you want to enter a competition to win the diamagnetic setup demo, then please leave a comment in the comment section. We'll pick one person at random at the beginning of September 2024 and send them the experimental setup. And as always, please subscribe and thanks for watching.